end. Good morning, everybody. Good morning and good afternoon or good evening, depending to where you are, you know. And 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 thank you all for for tuning in. And you know, please go ahead and say hi in the chat to everyone. Say where you're from. I mean, we have a great crew. Simon Hayes is with us from LA. Diego from Argentina, and then uh, Juan Calestino. Hello, Juan. And I actually saw earlier that Simon Walker is with us. He has a great Instagram called Orange and Teal, guys. You got to check him out. You know, I love that. Hey, Simon, good to see you here. And Yerlan from Kazakhstan. I love it. This is always when I kind of, you know, when I see these places around the earth, you know, and who loves color, I always, you know, get so excited about it. They're one small community, but, you know, very, very international. And then uh, we have a someone from Panama, Jose Gabriel, and someone from New York, Devon. Very good. Thank you, guys. Thank you all for joining in. This is so good to see you here. We are um, having another installment of Colorist Meetup. And today, um, our, our special guest is Lynette. Lynette, welcome. Hello. Hello. Nice <laughs> to see you, Dotto, and everybody else who's out there. Thanks for tuning in. It really makes me happy. Yeah. Thank you, Lynette, for joining in. Actually, you know, Lynette, I was thinking just as in a run up to this, that one day we should make behind the scenes of making these kind of meetups because it gets so exciting, you know, when we make it <laughs> sometimes. It's just the drama to make it. It's just really intense, you know. We, we had a, like a definitely an intense week trying to put it all together. So thank you for your patience with us. And, and you know, and, and, and there was a little bit confusion with the times, you know, we actually try to move these meetups for 11 o'clock as much as we can because of our audience in Europe. So I feel, feel I can see Isabel is with us. Oh my God, Alex is here as well from New York. Oh, you know, actually we love Alex. You know, he, he does, you know, beautiful, you know, work uh, in, for color, for, for, for Autodesk. I think, you know, we actually have to bring him back. It's a really, really amazing, you know, what they do there. And we have someone from Mexico City as well. And Ashley is here from Orange County. Beautiful. Ah, I love it. So, um, um, so, you know, Despite all the drama, I have to tell you, the last drama that happened was that this morning I had no internet. And I was like, oh, is there a possibility for anything to go wrong? Please, like, don't tell me I'm not going to have internet and there is a meetup starting in two hours. So I managed to plug cable directly into my router. So we're all good now, you know, but it, I tell you, Lynette, it, it was just an interesting one. Um, I also um, wanted to also thank Mike Toasty. You know, you probably know Mike Lynette, do you? You know, he, he was actually like, a, you know, telling me, hey, that one link wasn't working. I, I posted the, like a, you know, like registration and he helped me with that. And actually, I really want to thank you, Mike, for that. You know, that sometimes we don't know, like, uh, you know, sometimes it works well on our side and then we don't understand, you know, that the links might be, might be broken somewhere else. So thank you for, you know, helping with this as a kind of community spirit here. Um, now that we have kind of got, I think most of you dialed in. So thank you guys. I want to uh, start and we always start at the beginning. Um, so Lynette, I would like to start with your beginning. How did you become a colorist? Because this is a very interesting story. You know, everyone's has it one and, and I would love to hear yours. So how did you become colorist? What happened? Okay, this is way back in the way back machine. <laughs> <laughs> I started working at the Post Group in Hollywood uh, in the early 80s. And um, I was the uh, operations, the technical operations supervisor at the Post Group at the time. And um, it wasn't a fulfilling thing for me at the time. I, I love the technical part of it. But the artistic part of it was not there for me in that role. So I just happened to have had a friend who invited me to a color session that he was doing. It was for the movie Brazil, which this is a very long time ago. This was I, being done in a trailer on the deluxe lot in Hollywood at the old lab. And why in the trailer, Lynette? They didn't have Telus any rooms at that time on, on that campus. And oh. these films were being done at Deluxe at that time. And um, they had these trailers set up in the parking lot 
and they had telecine rooms in it. These are old film chains that were being used. These are all uh, ranks and tells. And probably with a Dubner color corrector, if we want to go way back in the in yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so um, my friend was color correcting Brazil, and I was just absolutely fascinated by it. And I said, you know what, this is the job for me. I, the, the, the technical part of it and the artistic part of it, it just seems like it would be a good fit for me. So I went to my boss, Rich Thorne at the Post Group, and I said, I would like to be a colorist. He said, okay, you can be a colorist. You know, that, it was that easy. That so, was I, <laughs> so I just, I sat in a telecity room with Howard Sisko and I became an assistant colorist uh, at that time. He was the colorist then. And um, he taught me what he knew. And he also taught me how to handle film, how to clean it, how to splice it, how to prep it. We were also doing a lot of nitrate at the time for the uh, UCLA Film Archive. God, that was life-threatening, right? It was. Well, I can tell you about in the days when people used to walk into the room with a cigarette hanging out of their mouths in the day of, of uh, cigarettes being allowed to be smoked in a facility. <laughs> that goes back farther than probably most people in this audience. But anyway, um, it, was, it made life exciting. But any, <laughs> anyway, so I learned how to prep film and I learned everything that he could teach me about film and about color correction. And about six months later, I started as a colorist. And, and then you were basically at the post group for, for, for X amount of years, isn't it, being a colorist there. And one of the very first in the world, really, Lynette, because there was, a, you know, at that time, most people didn't even know what, that there is even a job of a colorist, probably. I mean, well, I, I didn't know. I mean, when I went to college, I came to Hollywood right out of, out of school. And I just, you know, got in my car and I moved to Hollywood and I said, I'll find a job. And I found a job and um, <laughs> it turned out to be very, very nice for me. I was able to go and just kind of slide my way into that. But it was a lot of hard work, too, and a lot of hours. And um, but yeah, so I, I started um, in the film portion of that. And I'm definitely very film centric in the way my career has evolved. Um, I worked, you know, with probably every different kind of telecine except for the C reality, which was the HD um, version of the, the ranks Intel products. But mm -hmm. um, I've worked with pretty much everything from the quad, the quadra, the FDL 90, um, basically all of the uh, ranks Intel um, incarnations and then of course the spirit and all of that too. and if i'm correct um, lynette um you know those early days at the post group were really like uh, there was actually a lot of music video work going on or they used to call them pop promos i think back in the day um and and you know that was a really like a you know a lot and i mean there was a lot of stuff going through it isn't is this correct that's right well at the beginning of mtv um, brought the beginning of music videos as we know them kind of today. And uh, we did a lot of those. There was a lot of that done um, at the post group. And I did quite a few of them myself. So um, I just, and David Hussey in those days too. And David, of course, continues to do beautiful work with all of his Taylor Wait, Swift. Wait, you work with Dave Hussey back in the day. Well, yeah, and he and I, I was there and um, at the post group already in color, and he ended up moving from Toronto. He was at Mag North in, in Toronto and came to the post group, and that I believe was his first position here in the United States. Oh, after my moving God, from Canada. my God. Actually, you just you kind of gave me a great idea. He would be a fantastic person for our meetup. You know, we should oh, he's, he's the most lovely man on the planet and such a giving person and so talented and so smart. And yeah, okay. he would be awesome. And then, then that's it. Then, you know, we're going next, you know, today. <laughs> we need to yeah, get him. Yeah, call him up. <laughs> 
Uh, by the way, I just wanted to say that Paul Hill is saying hi, you know. And, Hello, Paul. Uh, <laughs> and then also like um, Darren Moistin is with us. And uh, I wanted to guys just to say he has a great YouTube channel with some tips. And I have to say I haven't learned like a, or in a while on a YouTube great tips. And Darren has actually made me learn some great things. I can totally recommend. And Darren, good to have you here. Thank you for being a part of this. And then we also have a few people like just joining now, like, you know, the Latinos are coming always a little late, you know, people from Brazil yeah. and Mexico, they always have few. <laughs> <laughs> what do you know? Just want to say they like all kind of now coming in and joining. And um, my friends in Mexico City, I did some training for chorus uh, but, down in Mexico City at one time. But talking about career. training, you know, I have to tell you one thing, you know, you know first of all, I have to admit, you know, that my um, wife, who is like a fierce feminist, you know, has got, you know, such a like a, he, he has a crash and you're like, to, she totally adores everything you do. And, you know, I probably you guys noticed that we had like an incredible promotion and, and you know, like 100 versions of banners and, and you know, and I and, and it was just my wife because she's like really, really like was so anxious about everything going well with you. She, she has an incredibly high regard for you. And I think primarily because, you know, of what you're doing for this industry, which I think most people don't even know, but you have actually taken a role of a... Um, uh, a mentor and you know this is something that is so rare to find nowadays that you giving your time away and and actually you know tra transferring you know your you know experience and wealth of knowledge that you have to young generations so tell us just a little bit about it how is that working for people who are interested in potentially you know being mentored by Lynette well um, first of all uh, Belinda Merritt who you many of you know she got me involved in the women in post hpa women in post and uh, women in post has an initiative that they kicked off about five years ago called the young entertainment professionals which is a mentoring um, uh, initiative that brings in young people ages 21 through 32 who are already working in the industry but in perhaps in a role that they would like to become something else or they would, they would like to be able to grow into a position that something that they're interested in. And they apply like going to school, like going to college, they apply and then are you know, vetted and then accepted into the program. And uh, they brought me in because, well, first of all, um, having a colorist, there are so many people that are into, you know, wanting to learn about color and they wanted a, a person to be able to go and mentor um, young aspiring colorists. And then the female part of that comes into play as well too, because there are a lot of women who are trying to get into this business. And um, for myself, there were very, very few women doing this. And um, I guess, a big part of my, you know, incarnation of my career is that I have had good mentors. They were all men, but they were people who really cared about me and about helping me grow my um, career and my skill set and all of these things. And I am so grateful to them for what they gave me that I felt very much compelled to be able to do this for someone else yes and so whenever and i can I do it, it and even, even if they're not my mentees in the program anybody who reaches out to me and needs to have some kind Beautiful. of help or just something I, i'm happy to do that beautiful lynette you know it is roman just you know posted on the chat that he's officially fan you know and, and, and i have to tell you i am as well this is such a you know great honor Aww. to have somebody with an attitude like yours you know because this is really you know you know something that money can't buy there is no way other way how anyone can progress in a career apart being mentored from somebody so thank you for being like that it's also what I learned from my teacher who also told me that I have to teach if I want to benefit from what he taught me. <laughs> so kind of, you know, I have to keep the wheel spinning. And it's a kind of the, 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 the you know, like how they say, like mantra that I had for most of my life is that, you know, you, you have to give in order to, you know, get back. 
and um and and well and that's what happens in the universe it's just what yeah, you give it's it's it just changes from energy. you get you get back from that yeah. <laughs> and then i i also um wanted to let you know that uh, you know if you ever um want to get any one of people that you mentor of any of our courses we have a now a great course coming up you know called color look academy which is kind of really artistic side of look creation not so much technical I'd be happy to, you know, enroll them in, in our course and, you know, help them grow like that as well. So please, you know, um, you know, my, my offer is on the table. If you want to, please let me know and, and we're going to help you with that. Oh, um, you know, I will. I already <laughs> <laughs> But I want to I now play. It. Yeah, I want to now play my one of my favorite jobs you ever did, actually. And, you know, and I deliberately didn't want to, like, you know, announce what it's going to be. I wanted everybody, you know, just to kind of be a little bit surprised. And it is kind of something that I, I, uh, I think, you know, you're going to stay remembered for, you know. So I want to just quickly play this clip. It's not going to be the whole one. It's probably about a half of that clip. But, you know, you guys just enjoy it for the moment. You can also dance with us while you're watching this as well. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. My favorite, you know, music video from Lynette. I think we should do this always. We should always like a start with a very good music video. I love it. I, I hope love you, it. I hope no one hurt themselves dancing to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And you know what? Actually, you know, this is a director's cut, isn't it? This is what we just saw. Yeah. It's a very special version that you have. It's not really one that you can find everywhere else, isn't it? Right. Well, the reason I sent it to you is that um, when I went to go and look for this online, there was only remastered up reses of it. Um, that wasn't, it didn't even look like my grade. So I sent this to you. And the only thing I had was um, Sam Bear's director's cut. So. I love it. I love it. You know, I love it. You know, I love it. So there was actually probably, I, 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 like I know, a collector item, you know, we have a director's cut of one of the best videos. I love it. Now, um, I want to move on. Because you did an incredible amount of work uh, in the early development of kind of, you know, film scanners. And um, I think it, in particular, we're talking about spirit, isn't it? You were actually the first user and a beta tester of the very first spirit. So is this correct? Well, it's kind of. So uh -huh. uh, the FLH 1000 was the the model before the spirit came out as an actual product. And that was the joint venture between Kodak and Philips. Um, there was another beta machine at Warner Brothers with Jan Yarborough even before that. But the actual beta test site for the spirit, the predecessor FLH 1000 was in Detroit. So um, a recruiter had called me um, who I ended up marrying the recruiter, which is weird, but that's another story for another time. But uh, I was recruited to go to Detroit um, from Los Angeles to, um, to be the beta test site colorist there. And um, that's when I got a chance to work um, with the Kodak and the Phillips crew, which was just an amazing experience. I just loved it. Um, but that's when I really fell in love with the technology and just understood what the CCD line array was all about, having a variable light source for the illumination of the film as it went through the gate. These things were very, very um, um, extraordinary at the time. Also, the thing about the scanner is that it uses a, a xenon light source and the xenon light is blue. And when blue passes through the orange mask of the negative, it is a complement. That means that you had a pure, in my feeling, and this was something that I think that we proved, we had a pure um, image that we didn't have to mask or put a masking on, which had to be done on the Rank Sintel. The Rank Sintel at the time 
had a, uh, a, a cathode ray tube, which was a greenish light source, which had to be masked when illuminating the orange mask of a negative. So this to me was something having the um, xenon light and the fast aperture and all of these things that were part of this technology at the time. This was extraordinary to me. And to me, far and away superior than anything that was being done at the time in my estimation. So mm -hmm. I worked on this for two years. And when I was about to leave, um, at the end of that two-year process, I said to myself, the only place I can go is to go to a place that will have the spirit, which there were, at the time, slated to be in New York and Chicago. So I ended up going to Chicago. We had the second delivery in North America in Chicago at the film workers. But the first one was John Dowdell in, uh, at the, the Post House in New York. And, and there was a basically time of high-end commercials being done in, in big rooms, you know, worth $1 million, you know, with the big scanners and all the processing and stuff like this, isn't it? This is really like, you know, what kind of, you know, made commercials go very high and, you know, that technology really is, was what changed it all. Well, I was, I, okay, so I'm going to brag again about something. <laughs> go ahead, um, go I on. did the first um, HD um, commercial to be shown in, in the United States. Um, I did it on the Spirit in Chicago, and it was for the first commercial broadcast of HD. It was a, a baseball game for, with the, uh, the uh, Texas Rangers. So it was a head and shoulders commercial that I scanned on the Spirit, I didn't have an HD color corrector. So I used the Da Vinci that I had that, I think it was the Da Vinci 888 going way back in the, this is before the resolve. And I used the actual primaries color correcting um, uh, corrector knobs that just controlled the primaries off of the spirit because we didn't have an HD color corrector. Mm -hmm. And so, but I did the, the first HD uh, commercial that was broadcast in that way. Ah, I see, I see, I see. And then, um, uh, and then how long were you at Chicago? How long did that last, you know, this whole period? Right, so I was there for 14 years. Okay. And um, it started off, of course, um, as you were, um, saying is just that you needed to have a facility with lots of money, you know, a million dollar uh, scanner, you've got a, you know, a multi-million dollar room. And that's the way it was done. So everybody would shoot their film. We had a lab, they would shoot the film, we processed it, we transferred it, we color corrected it, we would do the edit, all of these things. And so it was a very, very lucrative, very, very robust, you know, business model mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. But then came the revolution. The digital. Which was <laughs> the digital revolution. As, as George Lucas would say, the democratization of our business. Yes. Which was that you could go and you could shoot your stuff, you know, your material, and then you could go and debayer it or do whatever it is needed to, needed to do with that the color imagery, and then you could color correct it on your, you know, your system that you could afford to have at you know wherever you were, and this was the game changer for me because so much of my regional work these you know, a lot of money, a lot of billings were coming mm. through with people that would have to come to us. And at a point where it was, you know, all of my clients are now putting in their own color correction system. Oh, that's I'm, happened, I'm like, it? well, yeah. that's right. And that happened to a lot of people. Now, that's, of course, all shifted and changed again, where we have, of course, you know, very high end 
facilities doing very high-end work like the mill and nice shoes and all these other places that, that came into Chicago eventually with very high-end colorists. But at the time when this whole thing was shifting, I just realized that it was time for me to find another avenue, which mm -hmm. is why I ended up leaving Chicago, that it was time for me to probably go back to Los Angeles uh -huh. where I had a lot of contacts and a lot of friends and then something else happened in the, in the middle of that, which uh -huh. was to go to China. Yes. And you went there when it just opened, isn't it? You know, that was the crazy time because I, I, I happened to have been working on a movie in China when it, just was starting when they were like you know almost like a waking up and industry you know was built from zero you know and uh, and i did a, like a, one of the first 3d movies in china that, you know and and and, and 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 the amount of money they were throwing at the equipment was incredible but they literally didn't have anybody who knew even how to switch it on and um and but you know i do remember that shanghai very quickly became the center for high-end commercials and marketing like in whole kind of region, literally, I think they were covering more than Chinese market from from Shanghai. And I think this is where you worked, isn't it? You were you were doing commercials in Shanghai. That's right, exactly. So Beijing was really more uh, feature film oriented, and Shanghai was definitely for the commercials. Every major advertising agency around the world has got an office in Shanghai, mm. and so. Um, we had, um, I, I worked at the Technicolor Shanghai Film Group joint venture, which mm -hmm. eventually became MPC. Okay. So um, yeah, we started off thinking that we were going to be doing a very large part of the Shanghai Film Group um, film library, their archive, mm -hmm. as well as doing commercials. But it ended up being to be so successful with the commercials that was a became you know the, the lion's share of the business and visual effects so visual effects were you know just we had um, a number of very very talented visual effects people that had come in from from England to be a part of that team oh. and um, so anyway we just we did I did L'Oreal we did a lot of beauty work mm -hmm. for that um, I did a lot of car commercials Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of those things were for the um, local Chinese markets, mm -hmm. but then they were also for the regional areas of, of, um, of, okay. the, of, South, of Southeast Asia and yeah, Asia. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, then you're moving back to L.A. And I think you're going straight to like a, probably the best film post-production company at that time you know that had this incredible you know film scanners and the um, most beautiful 4k grading room it was just such a like you know kind of you know a little jewel in hollywood post-production environment a company called cinelicious isn't that's it right. that's right and it was really kind of a serendipitous thing that it happened that way i was looking to get back into the, the LA market and to reconnect with people that I knew in Los Angeles before I left. And it was really a nice entry back in because it wasn't just a post-production facility, it was a film-centric post-production facility. Mm. And um, Paul Corver, who owned the company, was very, very interested in promoting um, you know, film projects. So not just film projects that are shot now, but also doing a restoration of legacy projects. Mm -hmm. And that was just a great thing because that was really something that I was really interested back to in my UCLA film archive days of going and with these, you want to talk about jewels and treasures is holding in your hands a piece of film that, you know, is 60, 70 years old or, or older in some cases. But in, I had the chance to just to be able to be a part of um, seeing these, some of these legacy projects scanned, um, being able to grade them and the satisfaction of that besides being able to just to do new commercials that were being shot on, on 35 millimeter film and, um, 
and then just you know digital projects as well and i've always had a, a visual effects background so most of these things were visual effects heavy projects which i have always enjoyed doing and that was a, a very good kind of seamless um, entree back into the market and then to find my current home that i love which is instinctual instinctual yeah. Very interesting company, actually, you know, instinctually, like it's, it's one of those companies that is trying to stay below the ra radar, you know, like, and it's not necessarily one that is trying to kind of, you know, be in the front light and, and but because of the work that they do, you know, but they are actually one of the most regarded um, trailer companies in in los angeles i mean like and and you know trailers are interesting business because they, they are the perfect kind of you know cross between marketing commercials and feature films trailer is the most important tool for marketing and sale of a movie um, and it remains so you know things have changed you know we have you know internet marketing this type of marketing the, you know but but still trailer remains the most important tool and 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 it's absolutely no surprise that all companies big studios are still paying so much attention to detail when they are creating their trailers it's incredible the amount of effort that goes into creating a really good trailer because it is the most important thing that it will sell the movie and bring people you know to watch it um, so it is, it is very complex. It is very, very complex. I think most people don't really realize that, you know, but maybe what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly play one trailer, um, that is, you know, from, you know, one of your, you know, bigger clients from Sony and, um, and then basically we'll, we'll, we'll have a little bit to talk about it, you know, to what really goes into the trailer. And, um, if you agree with me, I'm going to first uh, play Spider-Verse, uh, and then yeah. we'll have a little chat about it. If you want me to drive you, we got to go now. No, I'll walk. Personal chauffeur going on. It's okay. Seriously, Dad, walking would have been fine. Breaking news, Spider-Man saves the day again. Spider-Man. This guy swings in once a day, zip zaps off Nancy. No. Accountability. Speed up, speed up. I know, you know these kids. Ability. Yo, Miles, man, you get arrested? Gosh, don't cops run red lights? Well, yeah, some do. But, uh, not your dad. In your universe, there's only one Spider-Man. But there is another universe. It looks and sounds like yours, but it's not. My name's Miles Morales. Hey, kid. You like me? How? I knew my day would come around this time. I know it's complicated. Just had to get my soul and free my mind. You want to know what happened to you? I can teach you to be Spider-Man. Mm, I love this burger, so delicious. Mm, one of the best burgers I've ever had. You have money, right? I'm not very liquid right now. I think you're gonna be a bad teacher. How am I supposed to save the whole world? You can't think about saving the world. You have to think about saving one person. One thing I know for sure, don't do it like me. Do it like you. I see the spark in you. It's amazing. Hands up! Whatever you choose to do with it, you'll be great. I love you, Miles. Yeah, I know, Dad. You gotta, you gotta say, say I love you back. Dad, are you serious? I, I want to hear it. it. You want to hear me I say it? I love you, Dad. You're dropping me I off out of school? You, Dad. Look at this place. Dad, I love you. Dad, I love you. That's, That's a copy. copy. Time to swing, just like I taught you. When did you teach me that? I didn't. It's a little joke for team building. Hey, guys. Okay, who are you? I'm Gwen Stacy. Come on. How many more spider people are there? Save us at Comic Con. What's Comic Con? Let's go! Wow. Unbelievable shaders, you know, on of that movie. It just looks like a like a comic book, isn't it? Like, you know, this is the closest I've seen like to a, like an animated movie looking really like as if you're reading an actual comic book because the shaders they look almost like as if they are being drawn and hand painted. 
it's looking incredible, actually. Well, there are some things in here that are cell animated. So there, are, this is, it's a, you know, obviously um, the CGI um, uh, project, but there are, they've done a lot of different treatments for this. So yeah, this is, this was an interesting thing to do um, because we started this a year before the DI was done and before the shots were done. And so that's kind of the thing with doing trailers that's um, interesting and, and challenging for us. It's just all of this can happen. We can get things from so many, there's so many different paradigms. In the case of doing the uh, animated materials from Sony Pictures Animation, most of these things are, these trailers are graded well before the DI can happen like this was done probably about a year before Natasha did the final and she's oh. she's so fabulous and all of her work is so gorgeous at eFilm um, and she did the final grade for the DI oh. but um, and that's really kind of the case on so many of the things that we do um, we get these these projects before you know, Stefan Sonnenfeld or Stefan Nakamura or David Hussey or all of those fabulous guys at um, Harbor Films. And um, we get a lot of these things before they see them. Now, in the case of Harbor, not so much, but um, in the case of, of, of eFilm and Company 3, a lot of those things do come to us before they get them. And then how do you then, you know, go around creating a look for the trailer? I mean, do you work then from some references from a director and DP or, 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 or who's then supervising that process? Well, in the case of, let's talk about Spider-Verse since yes. we're there. Um, we have, you know, communicated with the animation team before that. So they've given me instructions as to how this is going to be processed. So they, these are all ACES jobs, which make things very easy. So if I know that something's coming in at ACES at a certain white point, then I can set up. I work on Luster. Mm. Um, I also work on Resolve, but most of my projects are on Autodesk Luster. So then I go in and I, you know, change my transforms, the ACES transforms, the RRT ODT to um, the ACES to whatever the white point is. In this case, I think it was D65. Mm -hmm. And then the, the case of Connected and um, Connected is also D65. That's a project we're working on right now. And then um, uh, Peter Rabbit, which is a whole other thing, which we could talk about in a different time, but that mm -hmm. came to us through Animal Logic in, um, down in um, Australia. Uh, and so they give me this information and that means that we're all looking at the same thing and they understand that what it is that I'm doing um, is going to be true to what it is that they're expecting to see. Okay. So um, almost all the jobs that I do are remote to the lot from Hollywood. So I work in my theater in Hollywood in P3 and they are looking at it um, over at the lot in the Thalberg building over in the Sony lot. Mm. So we have, a, we have a sister theater over there and they have the same projector and all the same settings and we use the same profiles. So um, I get a head start. They've told me, okay, Spider-Verse comes through, the, the, uh, the cut is locked. I apply the right color management to it and mm -hmm. then we begin. Mm -hmm. So and is there like a show lot? Is there some sort of uh, reference? That, that's the show lot. That's the show lot. In, in that case, that is the show lot. So if I know that it's aces to whatever that white point is, that becomes the show lot. Excellent. So then we know that we're in the right zone. Okay. So in doing the animation, it, it really works beautifully because with aces, we are all speaking the same language. Mm. And that... That just, and no matter what platform you're on, it just works really, really nicely that way. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing animation, that part is, is really good. So I have a really good starting point. And then we can go through shot by shot and make adjustments. Now, in the case of, of these animated movies that are well before the, the DI, this is helpful to the animators 
to see this in the theater because they can go and this informs things that they need to tweak or things that they need to do or things that they need to pay attention to before they deliver the final DI for, mm -hmm. in this case, for Natasha. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's kind of the way that works, but it's just, it's a, it's a, a mixed bag though. We get so many different projects in so many different um, uh, workflows. Like in the case, some things I might get straight from company three because they're being graded by Stefan Sonnenfeld or Stefan Nakamura or, or David Hussey or Tom Poole. Those things will come to us because they'll end up doing the grade on the trailer, but I have to go ma and match back all the shots because uh, so many incarnations of this trailer will come in, new visual effects shots, new, um, um, I have to do blood removal on a lot of shots, a lot of, a lot of um, the MPA, some when people who are in- You have to do the blood, do you do actual also effect work on luster as well? Or do you kind of do actual kind of, you know, paint and removal and stuff like that yourself? I don't, when I say removal, I guess that's not a good, uh, way to say it. I do, um, I reduce the, the, the blood. So uh -huh. basically, um, <laughs> if, we, if we have to do a full removal, if somebody's got blood splattered all over their face and it, they need, or just, oh, there's blood all over the room. Let's say in the case of Bad Boys for Life, which just came, came through our place, I have to go back and match back all that color that came from out of house, no matter what it is, whether it's coming from Harbor for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or mm -hmm. Little Women, or whether it's Bad Boys or Sicario, which I had, I ended up having to do a lot of blood, blood reduction in that because <laughs> everybody's getting blown up all know. over the place. But wait, is this like a requirement in order to um, allow all audiences to watch it? Is this like what you have to do just simply because of the, uh, what's it called, MPAA, right? Right, so the MPAA is, um, a very big part of what happens in trailers and what makes our work in trailers different from somebody working on the DI. So let's, let's talk about Sicario for one of these things. If we're, for the people who are out there who are in a different country, in the United States, crazy enough with all the guns and the whole culture that there is, <laughs> legally, uh, domestic trailers, um, there's certain, certain stuff you cannot show and they're in a sense censored by the MPAA. Mm. And mm. that is um, something, those notes are sent from Sony to us. And so I end up having to go into certain shots and take the blood out. So in, in the case of bad boys, when that came in, we had to just go and just de-blood the whole room <laughs> Those would go to visual effects. But in the cases like a Sicario, I would go into like people with blood on their face or um, blood on the, the ground or whatever. And those would be that blood. I would, would have to key that out and make it darken. It would darkening the blood. It almost looks like motor oil when you're done. <gasps> you're going to see that um, in one of the trailers you're going to be playing today. In the case of Greyhound, there's blood in the water that had to be made to look like it was just oil. Should we, should we actually play Greyhound very quickly? Because I think yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful work. It's one of the kind of, I think this is one of the most recent jobs you did, isn't it? It is, just as COVID was coming in and there's a whole story behind that too. But let yeah, me, let's let's watch the trailer first and then we'll talk about it in, immediately. So here we okay. go, Greyhound. What are we gonna do? We'll bring hell down from on high. Congratulations on your first command at last. 
I'll always be looking for you, Evie. Even if I'm a thousand miles away. Air escort to Greyhound. You will now be out of range of air cover for the next five days. How many crossings does this make? This was my first. I got some. Most likely a U-boat. He's trying to slip under us! Fire! We have a kill. Distress rocket, sir. We have hits directly on the convoy. The wolf bag's haunting us. You both starboard bound! We've lost seven ships and 50 souls. What you did yesterday got us to today. It's not enough. Disappeared, sir. Here they come. What are we gonna do? We'll bring hell down from on high. And I love the fact that it ends, you know, with the Apple TV logo at the end. But that was not the original intention, <laughs> isn't it? Right? Right. <laughs> exactly. So this is one of the situations, and there are a number of those, where I work with the, the director of photography and the directors of the movie um, before they come out. So this was uh, Shelley Johnson is the DP of this movie. And uh, this was done with the intention of a theatrical release. Um, this trailer was originally done, as I do all of my trailers, the P3 is the hero color space. Mm -hmm. So this was graded in the theater, our theater at Instinctual. And, um, and a projector? And a projector. Wow. Yeah, I, I grade everything on a projector. On no way. Account. You yeah. still do everything on a projector. I do everything on a projector and then I make my deliverables from there. And so I know it's kind of backwards, the HDR comes after that too, but because um, we are Sony's trailer, theatrical trailer house, um, everything's done that way. And this, was, and this was supposed to be at the theaters, but then COVID happened and uh, Sony ended up uh, selling this property to Apple. So the so what you just saw there they they put in their um, their uh, titles and all of that but this was the original grade of my trailer. So that but was, but so so this is another one of those examples where you basically got the raw material literally right or ungraded you know materials yes. with effects and conformed and somehow you know like put together in front of you in the best possible you know resolution and, and format and you started from zero. And you build the look, you build the mood, you you match the flow. You basically everything had to happen from scratch. There was no graded, pre-graded shots before you started. That's right. That's right. But in the case of so many of these things, I do get a show let from time mm -hmm. to time, and I can either use it or not use it. There are many times I do use it. Mm -hmm. um, however. Uh, in this case, I think I did it as aces. I got to choose myself because I didn't, uh, we were kind of in the wild, wild west. We've got this stuff in and we had to get it done. And I don't know that I, I had something sent to me. Um, so I ended up doing it as aces because it makes it easier for me to do the HDR at the end mm -hmm. as well. But um, what I did get is from Shelly Johnson, who is the, uh, the DP, he's, he, sent me stills that he wanted me to to match the look to he was on set on a, a different production so he sent me these things and then when he was able to come into los angeles he sat with us and then we went through and graded Finished. it but the other thing is okay another part of doing trailers is that the ultimate ultimate last say are the creative executives at the at the uh, studio 
Okay, so not the director we, anymore. <laughs> so the director. It, but it's because trailers are, as you were talking about earlier, are a commercial for a movie. So the artistic intent is there by the original filmmakers, but it is the creatives at the studio who drive it at the end because they're, they know what they need to punch. They know what they need to do to message it. And because all of the shots that you see in a trailer are out of context, some shots that, the, you know, that are sitting next to one another are in different parts of the film completely. So if, if my DP wants it to look beautiful in the way they intended, maybe that shot does not sit well with the shot that it ends up being with in the trailer. Mm -hmm. So it is the creatives at the studio who say, I need you to punch this up. I wanna see less of this face. I wanna see more of that face. Um, I want to make sure that we see, you know, something that's in the corner of the, of the shot that may help and tell the story for the trailer. Ah. So it, the, those things, those people are going to end up driving. Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes sense, you know, because it's at the end of the day, you know, it's their responsibility, you know, to kind of make sure the trailer does the job, you know, and, and I don't think that the director always, you know, has the right, you know, how they say the right view and an angle for it, right? You know, because, you know, you kind of have to see how am I going to bring this product to the market and not nice. And for that, you need a particular experience. You need to understand you know where trailers go what happens so it totally makes sense it's, so you see this is exactly what i mean like this is totally marketing world this is what you used to have in commercials isn't it this is how commercials work an agency at the end decides how things are going to look it's their call director you know could shoot and decide maybe what he wants or she wants but at the end of the day it's agency's job to make sure this is going to be a successful commercial so it's a very much same approach with trailers as well that's right. And the head of the studio sees it, too. And then we get to the end and the head of the studio says, oh, I don't know about that. And oh, my God. <laughs> so wait, wait. So how long can this process last? Because when you have so many opinions and so many people coming in and this, how long does that like grading of a trailer can last? For example, on, on an example of Greyhound, how long was this process from the beginning till the end? Not necessarily how many continuous you know hours you work but like how long did it take you from the moment you know you got to conform to the moment they approved it well it can be a number of days i mean it can be a day when it's like an emergency or it can be a week and sometimes yeah. these things get recut time after time after time and that's another part of doing the trailer work all of all of these shots and all of these cuts are being updated to the minute of delivery. And so we go, let's say, and, you know, work on a trailer. I work on the, the, the pre-color, then the uh, director of photography comes in. I do the color with him. Then perhaps the creative comes in and says, you know, A, B, C, and D with their notes. And then the head of the studio sees it and said, you know, there's a part in this, this is not working for me. And then we end up starting over again. Now, it, oh, wow. that didn't happen necessarily with Greyhound, but it's happened on on many, many and, and, and things that how worked do you on. manage that? Now, so you work on, on, on Luster, right? Which is very kind of similar now to Flame, actually, isn't it? So, so, so do you have a, like a, some assistant, you know, that prepares all the conform for your, how do you guys manage different versions and grades for different shots it, 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 you know how how does that really kind of practically happen well the conform artist is my boss <laughs> okay great <laughs> um instinctual has three partners doug ludwig and jesse morrow and alan letary each have their own specialty and um I work in the theater with Doug. He has a standing desk next to my standing desk in the theater. And um, he conforms the timelines. He updates the timelines. And we work in this workflow, which is something that's been a proven thing for them over the years, even in their, their days at ColorWorks back in the Sony days. Um, and that, that timeline is conformed for me. And and updated for me and I'm able to just grab this stuff on the fly really really fast whether it's from visual effects or 
from, from the conform artists. So uh, they can also work in the background. If I'm working with the, with the creatives, they're constantly working in the background, you know, saying, oh, okay, we need to have this shot, this updated visual effects shot. We need to have this, we need to have that. And it's always being prepped for me in real time as we're going. And then I'll just, Doug will say to me, okay, this shot's ready to go. And I'll just grab it and, mm-hmm. uh, and put, it, put it put it in. And, uh, and that could be visual effects. It could be a new, new shot. It could be a new graphic. Um, I'm just about to do this. When I say goodbye to you, I will be um, driving into Hollywood to, to look at the timeline for Connected, which we're working on right now. And, and all and those I've, things will be... And, and is it correct that you actually have a direct line to Sony Studios so they can watch on their you know, projector right. exactly what you're doing? That's right. I just did. I just work with the, the Sony Pictures animation team on Monday, getting all of the grades set for all the trailers I'll be delivering this afternoon. So I prepped, we do what's called a change cut, which uh, in the Resolve world is called color trace. Ah. So all the grades that... Um, I've established with the creatives are going into all the new cuts that I prepped this morning while I was wearing my pajamas, <laughs> so, which is what we really like of, about having uh, this uh, at home uh, remote workflow. So I can, <laughs> can do that. And uh, then I'll look at it at the projector at work this afternoon. And then make sure everything is perfect. I love That's it. Right. But this is a great workflow, actually. This is beautiful. So you do a lot of like prep work and then you say you go to the theater only to do the final touches to make sure everything is exactly how you think it should be. Tweak it because it's different when you're on a projector for sure. And That's then right. basically that's the final master. That's right. Okay. I have to say, you know, one thing about you that you know, when I met you, you, you also came to our class, the HDR class, you know, and, and, and um, you know, despite, you know, years of experience, there is a still like a, like a child in you that gets so excited about, you know, new, new things, you know, and, and, and I have actually kind of so much admired your enthusiasm for HDR, you know, and, 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 and how much you loved it and how much you wanted to get in control and learn and, 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 and so on. And, and actually, you know, that's very rare because normally people, you know, that come from film, they keep moaning about any change. They would have loved if things would have never changed, if you ask them. Yet you are like so happy to progress and to move and to get to the new stuff. And you really, really are driving things forward. And, and you know, back a year ago, you know, HDR trailer wasn't even, you know, going to exist so much. We didn't know that's going to happen yet. You really wanted to be, you know, prepared for it when it happens. I just really, you know, wanted to hear you know like how you know how how come you know you you are so embrace new technologies and 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 you know where does this come from well i would have to say it's survival what are we gonna do (laughs) i could go and wring my hands oh the days of film are gone oh but you know there's so much exciting stuff out there and there's nothing like going and seeing material that you're that you're working on, seeing it in HDR or just seeing it in the most beautiful way that it can be seen. It's so exciting to do that and just yeah. go, and just it takes your breath away sometimes. You go, yeah. uh, I've been working on something in P3 and I think it looks so amazing. And then I go and put it into my HDR monitor and go, whoa, okay. Wow. Yes. And learning how to do it well. And that was one of the things that I really have to thank you for, which oh. is to help me understand the aesthetic. Because just because it's brighter and just because it's colorful and more colorful doesn't need mean it needs to be exactly that, where it's just killing your eyes and <laughs> whatever. It it just it there's an aesthetic that we need to have to make it beautiful and to appreciate you know, yeah, Lynette, I'm sure you would have figured it out yourself, you know, without, you know, my help, you know, it would just take a little longer, you know, it just happened that I've been there for there from the day one. So I learned the hard way. I was like, you know, no, it can't be this can't be the look, you know, so, so, you know, I just kind of had like a few jobs that really helped me understand it, you know, in a quicker, but I do agree with you that that actually, you know, it's really our responsibility as colorists to fight that 
you know, uh, assumption that the HDR has to look bright and, and, and saturated, you know, that's absolutely not the case. And, um, and, and, and I'm happy to see that, you know, that, that, you know, there are some, you know, more and more beautiful HDR projects out there where, where you really forget that you're watching an HDR image because it just, you know, it's such a beautiful gray that doesn't really hurt. It's, it's just feels very well. Just on that note, you know, did you uh, have to grade Greyhound uh, for in HDR as well? Uh, we, I'm not exactly sure what our delivery for that is, but I have all, I have done an HDR grade on it. Yes, okay, and so it, it, it looks gorgeous. So it's happening. I, so I basically, it. the 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 HDR trailers are happening. This is really what studios are embracing, and they're doing it now. Right, they are. Um, as far as how that's all going to go forward, I mean, this is all the wild, wild west once again with uh, COVID mm. and just. Um, just how we're going to do all of these things. I can't speak to that at this point, but we are prepared yeah. for it. Yeah, let's wait. Let's wait a little bit because I think by by kind of September, October, I think that the, the you know the decisions will be made on that level. You know where they need to be made in order for us to understand. You know how the industry is going to pivot. The fact that you know cinemas might not get busy anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So we'll see that, and that, that certainly affects you. But for your trailer work, but I hope it's not going to affect, you know, the work and the creativity you guys deliver because it's just absolutely amazing. You know, the, the work that Instinctual does, including all the beauty work and the quality of your output is just unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. We work really hard at it. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. So on that note, um, Lynette, I want to thank you for, uh, you know, your time. You know, I want to thank your boss for letting you speak to us as well and, and making, you know, getting, a, you know, allowing you to come to work a little later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and, and listen, you know, it is such a pleasure, you know, to, to have you as our guest. I really hope, um, you know, that audience is really going to learn something from this talk and you know and that they're going to be inspired by your attitude as well because i think you know there's nothing more beautiful you know than to meet a person like you who's been doing it and still has a, such a positive view on, on our industry so thank you thank you for you know your time and for contributing to our small colorist community well it's my pleasure thanks for inviting me thank you so much thank you speak to you soon bye, bye, -bye. okay bye bye, bye, -bye.